So, um, my name is Leong. I'm a senior software cloud architect. I work for Intel. Um, I have about more than 15 years experience in application developments and the cloud-based infrastructures. Um, in the past, I got a chance to work on different type of applications, including peer-to-peer -peer applications, online streaming media applications, distributed architectures, and academic research as well. So I completed my PhD in 2013. So my PhD generates about um, multi-cloud orchestrations. Um, I'm, so, I'm also actively involved in various OpenStack working group. So that includes enterprise working group, product working group, and application ecosystem working group. So in the past, I worked very closely with the foundation and the community members. And we have published two e-books, generate about, um, talk about um, how, what is OpenStack and how to implement OpenStack in the enterprise context. And this coming Friday, we actually having another book sprint. I'm going to develop the third e-book um, focusing on application developments um, for OpenStack. All right, um, so today's agenda, um, I'll talk about what is the business drivers that we want, want to move into microservices and API-centric design. Um, I'll briefly discuss about the architectures. Um, I'll also talk about the OpenStack, what kind of OpenStack services and API um, can be useful um, when it comes to microservices um, application deplo deployment. And I, I, will also, I will also use an example to illustrate uh, what are the differences between uh, different architecture style. So before we jump into that, um, I just want to get a quick idea. And anyone has done microservices application development before? Okay. And how long have you been doing that? More than a year or less than a year? More than a year? Right, good. So um, this talk basically I'm generally focusing on the beginner, beginner levels. So um, we'll cover some of the high level overview. And so I would like to ask um, if anyone here is looking at migrating existing app into the microservices architectures? Right. And looking at integrating with existing enterprise systems? Right, so what's the business, why, why, why do we need to move into microservices? Um, I think we, everyone knows that we're now living in a very rapidly changing and competitive environment. So someone told me that the only thing that doesn't change is change itself. So we had to be, um, we, had, we need to provide an environment for our, for our application developers so that they can do faster innovations and we have to grab the market opportunity whenever there's new um, opportunity available. And at the same time, we also have to integrate with our existing uh, systems or database or, or the data so that we can provide the, the exposing the data securely to other line of business or our partners or the customers. And the key thing is we, have, we, need, to, we, we need to deliver new services faster and more reliable. So I just want to share one experience in the past when I worked for a startup company many years ago. My boss um, is a good boss, and he generally, a lot, a lot of times he has a lot of idea, good idea, and he always asks me, can we implement these features or not? And can we implement these ideas or not? And I, I look at that and say, yeah, why not? We can do it. And I always ask the question, when do we need that? And he always told me that yesterday. <laughs> so we are living in a very tight deadline today, so we really have to provide environment for our developers to deliver software faster and reliable. So I talk about architectures now. So I believe most of us are familiar with these monolithic architectures. We used to do this um, for the past decades or more than 15 years. And in this model, application generated design um, in a, in a three-tier architectures and in mono, with a monolithic design. So every function and every module is actually bundled together for the application. And this model provides a very simple way for us to develop the software, simple to test, and easier to deploy as well. But one of the key things or challenges in this architecture is when we start growing our applications, 
it became harder for us to extend or enhance a particular module or particular feature. And because modules can be extensively dependent on each other, and the code become difficult to refactor, especially when you go beyond millions of lines of code in a monolithic architecture. It also requires a long-term commitment in a particular technology stack. If you're using Java to design, design these architectures, you probably have to stick with the Java technology for 10 years. It depends on your application lifecycle. So sometimes it becomes very, very difficult to debug when it grows beyond a certain, amount, certain amount lines of code. So even a potential bug in a specific module that leads, to in the, that leads to the memory leak can bring down the whole cluster or bring down your whole systems. And if we, when, we, when we want to scale this, um, in this architecture, we generally took the whole structures or the whole wall file if you are in the, in the, in the Java world and then duplicate those in, in, across multiple instances. So this is what we have been doing in, in the monolithic architectures. And then later on, um, there's this service-oriented architecture came up. And this, I think the idea of service-oriented architectures is very promising. And, but the key thing is um, it became complex to implement in the enterprise, in, in the enterprise world. So service-oriented architectures, right, basically you have a multiple um, delivery channel that you need to support. And in the middle, you have a lot of core services that you want to support for the business functionalities. And there's a lot of data sources that you need to um, provision to your, to your client as well. And, the, and as I mentioned just now, it become complex over the years when coming to SOA. Um, for SOA, we try to expose software as a XML web services. And there's a lot of, we use a lot of things called WS standards. I'm not sure if you are in the service SOA world, you're probably familiar with all those WS terms, WS addressing, WS policy, WS security, all those different kind of standards. And it become more and more complex, or some even proprietary technology in the SOA uh, world. And it doesn't really help us to deliver software faster or more reliable. And in fact, and, and in the worst case, and sometimes in the worst case, it even, it even make it us slower or prone, prone to the errors when coming to SOA design. So when, today we come into this concept about microservices. Um, some people view this as very, very similar to, they, they, they think that microservices is very similar to SOA. I think that's, fi that's a fine statement. And to me, I think that microservices basically make making the SOA easier and without the burden of all those WS specifications or the enterprise service bus. And one thing about microservices is it's not just about technical changes. It also involves in um, changes in your organization, organization structures. So in the past, when you have, a, in a, in a, especially in the enterprise uh, context, if you design a monolithic architecture with a three-tier architecture, you probably have a design team just working on the only responsible for the front end. You have an application team just develop the application logic. And you have a database team just, just working on the database layer. But when coming to microservices, your team basically responsible for the whole thing. And every microservice is, is being developed, managed, and deployed independently. And we use a lot of uh, this HTTP or REST-based API. And the key concept about in REST is about resource, right? So which typically, represent, uh, which typically represent a business object, such as your um, customers or, or products. And we use a lot of, we try um, CRUD model, uh, create, read, update, and delete, and use that together with the H standard HTTP, HTTP verts, such as, for example, you use post, HTTP post, to create a new resources. Um, you use a put to update the uh, resource, you use a get, HTTP get to read the resources, and use HTTP delete to remove the resources. So these are the things that we do in uh, some of the concepts in the microservices. So when it comes to the microservices patterns, um, every services tends to have their own database schema. And for example, here you can see S1 basically use S DB1, and S2 basically is DB2, and S3 basically using uh, DB3. Every service itself 
has their own database schema. And we try to decentralize the data store in a microservice design. And this will have low impact whenever there's a schema changes to the particular services. And this model is very different from the enterprise data modeling perspective. So we, in microservices, it seems that we are duplicating some data across services. And the benefit of, is, the benefit of this is like we try to do a share nothing architecture. If you try to, if you try to share your database across many, many services, and if there's a change in the database schema, it will, it will, impact, it will, give, it will give you a lot of impact for the rest of the uh, micro, other services as well. So my recommendation when coming to microservices design is try to design your microservices with their own individual database schema. And, of, and in terms of deployment, uh, microservices can be, every service can be deployed in a single VM. And of course, you can also deploy multiple VM or multiple services on a single VM. But re my recommendation is also one services, one VM. That, that make it easier to deploy or scale. And in the microservices world, you're probably familiar with all the service discovery. You can, because every service is now in the microservices world, service A, service B, and service C, they need to talk to each other. And we need a, we need a service discovery model. So we can use the client-based client uh, service discovery or a server-based service discovery. And I think if you guys are familiar with the Netflix open source projects, I think they provide a lot of open source tooling that help you to design Microsoft services, including service discovery tooling. And from the communication, every service needs to talk to each other. In microservices world, we generally, we generally see about messaging, message queue, or using HTTP and REST API. So microservices do give us a lot, give, give us a lot of benefits, but it also comes with some challenges. So yes, in microservices, it gives us a, a higher level of modularity. Every individual module can be developed um, individually and communicate over a standard interface. And you have a very, um, you can, every app microservices is isolated by itself. You have a better separation, separation of concern. And every service has a well-defined boundary of their functionality, as well as a well-defined API contract. And as I mentioned earlier, we can deploy microservices independently. And once, once we have the ability to, ability to deploy services independently, it, get, it, it actually lessens the dependency between your development teams. Because every development team, if you keep it small, you can deploy, you can develop those, those, that team can focusing on their own services and develop more quickly and making the CI CD process easier. And also, it, it also makes us, from the uh, engineering, st engineering standpoint, it's making us easier to innovate and easier to align. Um, sometimes it allow, allow us easier to align the services to a specific hardware profile, depending on, your, on your, what kind of services you're building. For example, if you're building a CPU-intensive services, or memory-intensive services, or I.O.-intensive services, those can be built independently. Those, those can be built independently and deployed independently on a specific hardware profile. But um, microservices, on the, challenge, on, the, on the other hand, microservices do, give, do have some challenges, when, especially when coming to new into microservice design especially into the, in the disputed architectures. The way that we handle transactions is totally different in, in, in disputed architectures. And even in the disputed, disputed architectures, we have a lot of challenges in terms of um, network latencies or the network, network failure. And when it comes to um, testing or debugging, it can be more challenging as well. And if you are doing logging, um, make sure that you have a correlation ID between service call, because one, because they are, we are calling microservices everywhere. But, uh, imagine that, let's say you have tons of hundreds of um, microservices. If every services have a, uh, is calling each other, if you, want to deploy, if you want to debug that as a whole system, making sure that every request call has a correlation ID so they can trace the request over, uh, over the services, between services and services. Another thing about Microsoft design is, um, you need to talk about, think about the API compatibility. Uh, when, you, when you have different versions of microservices around, uh, make sure that the client can still use the older API 
and when, when you deploy the new version of the services. So just now I mentioned about in the distributed architectures, the doing transaction is very different. So um, in a trans if you want to do a transaction in a distributed environment, uh, you probably can move the transaction logic into the client side, or you can do some distributed locking services. But I, I would like to um, encourage you to think about a different um, design, which is called what we call the eventually consistent, the CAP theorem. So in the CAP theorem, uh, any, do you guys familiar with the CAP theorem? Right, okay, so I don't have to explain too much. So we, in, in distributed architectures, we, we can only pick two of them, right? So if the, there's a network partition, we can, we can only choose either um, consistencies or availability, right? So when coming to microservice design, um, we tend to move towards eventually consistent. So we want to make sure that both sites, both clusters, is available. If you have two clusters at two sites, for example, we want to make sure that we want to achieve the highest availability as much as possible. And we want to do higher, higher availability in the distributed architectures. If there's a partitioning, we, have to, we can only match, I mean, because we still want to make sure that both sites can still doing updates or reading the data. So, but if you have partitionings in, in, in between, you cannot make sure that both sides are consistent at the same time. So, but when, the partition, when, when you re re recover from the failure, eventually they'll become um, consistent. So that's what, we, that's what we call a new design in, in, in the eventually consistent model. So in microservices or dis uh, design in a distributed architecture, um, some, company, some people might have a challenge when moving into um, eventually consistent model depending on how you structure the data. So next one, um, I want to talk about the OpenStack services and API. So immutable infrastructures. Have you guys heard about immutable infrastructures? The concept about immutable infrastructures? I think when coming to cloud-based or cloud-native application design, um, we have to look at these immutable infrastructures. Immutable, according to definition, is unchanging over time or unable to change. And if you think about in Java programming, a string is immutable, right? I mean, a, Java st a string in Java is immutable, which means that one is created, the values cannot be changed. And if you want to change it, a new string is created and a new reference is being updated. So we have to think the same way in cloud-based infrastructures. And OpenStack do allow us to create immutable infrastructures. So by using immutable infrastructures, um, let's go through about this, yep. So in a, if you're not using immutable infrastructures, basically every time when there's a package update or changes in the config or application updates, you basically have to update the VM, every, in, every, every integer VM. And you have to maintain all these lists of VM and make sure they are, they are always staying at the state that you want it to be. But we're not doing that in the microservices. Um, in the microservices design, we want to make the infrastructure immutable. So when you first have your version one of the services, we call it V1, you deploy it on a VM. If you come have a new version, we create another VM and uh, deploy the version two, and then we brought, bring down the, the, the the previous versions and they update the link to the second versions. So by using OpenStack Cloud, those API, we allow us to create immutable infrastructures. And it allows us to simplify the operations and allow us to do continuous deployment with fewer failures. Okay. And every time we, when we, when we create a new instance, we basically test it and before we move into, into production. So that, that also gave us a battle a confidence that our infra infrastructure is being tested. That brings me to the next topic about infrastructure as code. So we have to treat our infrastructures seen as the code, okay? So any changes to infrastructure is the same, very, is the same as changes in the code. So when you change in the code, you actually up, bump up a new versions. 
So in the microservices design, same thing. All these things should be modeled as infrastructure as code. Everything should be defined as a code. Anything changes to the infrastructure itself will trigger a new deployment or a new version. Another thing that I want to talk about is the API-driven uh, infrastructures. Have you guys used OpenStack SDK or API in your application design before? Yes? OK. So in the past, um, when you want to deploy the applications, usually your sysadmin or operators will provision the VM before you can do any deployment software on the, on, on the VM itself. And if your software your application requires some storage, your admin, sysadmin also have to pre-provision pre those storage before your application can use them, right? So, and even if your application requires some computation uh, resources, your sysadmin will provision that VM before it can do anything to the, to the other VM. That's what we do in the past. But today, in, from OpenStack perspective or a cloud-based infrastructure perspective, um, there's this API-driven infrastructure, and your application code, uh, if you require some storage, we can use the API to call the object storage dyna dynamically in your application code. And you can also use your API to create the VM within the application code itself, and then you can do something on the VM dynamically inside your application code. So you don't, on, on the whole process, it doesn't require any sysadmin to be involved. And that makes you very flexible and easier to scale your infrastructure depending on your, on your use cases. And someone might, ask, might, ask me, might be asking me that the first VM, we probably still have used a, a, the sysadmin provision before you can do anything. But I would like you to think about that. Um, it might not be today. So it is possible that we can deploy even without the first, first one. So I'll leave that as a question for you to think about it. So next, I want to go through an example. Um, I want to use this example called online video platforms or video transcoding. So in these examples, um, the requirements basically is like users, they have to upload the media files. And once they upload the media files, the system has to transcode the video file into multiple, multiple formats for various devices or display and formats. And the users is basically spread across different geographical locations. And of course, budget is a constraint. Nobody has an unlimited budget. So how, how can these um, requirements, if you're given these kind of requirements, um, how can we build this application? If we do it in a monolithic architecture, monolithic way, this is usually how we do, right? So you have the web front end, you have the application tier, and you have a database and probably have a shared storage for storing those media files. And you probably need uh, upload functions. You also need a uh, transcoding functions. You also need a playback function, generally. And all this module is being de developed as a monolithic architecture. And when you want to scale this kind of deployment, you basically scale the whole thing together and using a shared same database or the shared, uh, shared file storage. So when coming to how, how can we refactor these architectures into the microservices way? So let's try to make it more interactive. So remember we have three functions. One is upload, and the other one is transcode. And the third one is playback. So how, if, if you were to up, try and, um, migrate the previous monolithic architectures into microservices way, how are we going to do that? So first thing, probably the upload functions, right? You can take your upload features out and design that as a microservices. And you probably have to define some sort of API contract. And user can go to the upload UI, to the API gateway, and you define your upload services with some REST, using a REST API, and that upload services actually can upload the contain into the object storage. Um, and today, an OpenStack Swift do, uh, do provide um, the object storage and allow 
it supports HTTP protocol. It can allow users to upload um, file into the into the HTT, uh, object storage directly as well. If you set up the authentication and policy correctly. So that's the very first part that you can take your monolithic ar architectures into the mi first microservices that you want to do. I remember in two years ago, about two years ago, I presented a demo talking about how we we architect a WordPress application and push all the web static contents into the object storage. And all the static contents will be served directly from the object storage, the Swift object storage, without a web server. Because the Swift object storage supports HTTP protocol. So that is one way that you can think about when coming to refactoring your existing applications into microservices. So moving on, we got, have done the upload services. What is the second thing? Transcode, exactly. So you, you probably want to do a transcoding job. So you have to define your transcode services. And in the transcode services, probably you want to call some transcoder worker. The transcoder, transcoder worker basically is the one responsible, responsible for doing the transcoder task, such as using FFmpeg if you're familiar with the transcoder world. And once the transcoder task is completed, you will just update the destination, the, 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 the transcoder file, into the destination object storage through the HTTP protocol um, using the Swift object storage as well. And if you, if your trans, let's say for example, um, your application grow bigger and demands become higher, um, you probably want to grow your transcoder, this component, without affecting the rest of the services. And one thing you can do is probably set up a resource manager to monitor this transcoder worker. If there, let's say for example, if your one request required to transcode a media file to multiple, let's say uh, you have one media source file, but you want to transcode into 10 destination files, you generally have to spin out uh, 10 transcoder worker just for that particular task. So we can define a resource manager here and to do the auto scaling for the transcoder. One reason that I'm not proposing to use, um, I mean, you can use um, the, the, the in, in OpenStack, you can use a heat auto scaling, but the heat auto scaling to, um, to me is a more passive auto scaling way. What I mean is, in a heat auto scaling, it will only scale or create additional instances when the CPU reach a certain threshold, right? So it's more passive way. So if you do the things in this, we're having a separate resource manager to monitor the load of the transcoder, you do it a more active way. And one interesting part about this example is in a transcoder, because we are doing transcoding tasks, transcoding task is very CPU intensive, and it is not idea for you to set up auto scaling based on a heat template based on a CPU because every, a single transcoding task can consume 100% of the CPU, 80 or 100% of the CPU. And that doesn't make sense for you to scale additional instances, let's say if you only have one transcoding task and you reach 100%, which is totally fine with the, according to application logic, it doesn't make sense for you to scale another one because there's no, more other, no other transcoding task. However, if you use this model, you also can predict your you can, you, can also, you can also put, up, put in some prediction algorithm to make sure that to understand your transcoding workload in the past. And you can predict that if there are certain transcoding tasks coming in within a certain period, you can pre skill your transcoder before the load get, gets in. So this is more what I call a more proactive scaling mechanism. And the last thing is upload, um, playback, right? So on playback, you, can, you also need to define your API. And then you have a playback, playback UI talking through the API gateway. And then you have a playback service that get retrieve the transcoded media, the destination file, and play it back to the users. And it can, because uh, in the microservices way, it allows us to um, customize the UI according to different services. For example, um, in a, in a video, online video platform, you probably have a, on, a content creator only, only working on the upload, 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 um, upload UI. But your playback can be serving to millions of users. So you can scale your playback UI and creating a different experience without affecting your upload, upload services. So that's how we can refactor uh, media transcoding application from the monolithic architectures into a um, 
microservices architectures. So I think we can apply the same logic to add other applications as well, and depends on how you want to use it. Um, but if you look at this new architecture, what do you see here? Remember what I have talked about the challenges compared to the monolithic architectures? Doing all these things allow us to scale better or allow us to create additional service better. However, this is more complex to do, especially come into deployment. You have to deploy different services, multiple services, and every service needs to talk to each other. And that's why we have this API gateway. Or um, if you're familiar with the Netflix um, open source, Netflix do give you a lot of um, open source software like, um, that you can use for the API gateway or the service discovery model. All right. So we have talked about different architectures. We talk about the microservices patterns and the challenges in microservices. We talk about OpenStack cloud-based infrastructure, infrastructures. How can we use uh, OpenStack cloud-based infrastructures or API-driven infrastructure to support the microservices design? And that's why we conclude today. If you have any, any questions or feedback, please send an email to me, or you can send a tweet to me. I will try to check the tweet this, this few days. And if you are interested, interesting, you can go to the, this cloud app. There's a cloud app launch at the marketplace, and you can find me there. And I'll be at the Intel booth in at four o'clock. Right. So um, there's a book signing. Remember the ebook e that I have mentioned just now. There's a book signing event at four o'clock. You can find me over there. Okay. I think I'm almost running out of time. So if you have a question. Just let me know, OK? Thank you, everyone. I'll remember to read this.